if we step back for a second, Catherine, can we explain what exactly is an urgent care plan? So there are various different types of plans and slightly different languages is used. But as healthcare professionals, I think we have a general understanding of an urgent care plan being a plan that's made in conjunction between healthcare professionals, patients, families, when a person is much more likely to present to the urgent care services. So it helps share information to those urgent care services. And so that would include the London Ambulance Service, for instance, but also maybe a team within an emergency department at the hospital who may have never met that person before. And it would share information about their care plan or the best way to treat them. So very often those patients are in the end of life phase because they we know that end of life patients often present more frequently. But an urgent care plan is equally applicable to a child with complex, difficult epilepsy, for instance, where we might share information about their medical management just to ensure that whoever's on receiving them and delivering their care is fully up to date with the care that's happened before. So the urgent care plan allows us to do that in a way that we can share across the entire geography of London, which is a quite unique system for doing that. And what included in the urgent care plan? What does the patient need to specify? So I think within the urgent care plan at the moment, we have various sections. We have sections for just who the patient is, some of their demographic information. And then we have some really important sections about patient wishes or characteristics that are particular to that individual person. And another healthcare professional who's never met that person before might need to know to be able to treat them the most effectively. Um, it could include things about language barriers, for instance, if someone wasn't particularly English, wasn't their first language. It could be about characteristic, say they had a dementia illness. It could be about things that, that cause them distress, so bright lights or loud noises. Again, very relevant to, to patients with learning difficulties sometimes or autism. So it includes lots of things that might be useful around that. And then it includes sections as well around more medical information. So we would, there is a treatment section where you could detail information about an epilepsy treatment plan and what, work, what has worked well in the past. And then it also includes at the moment as well areas that are much more in the end of life spectrum. So things around CPR and treatment escalation decisions and patient wishes in the light of maybe a poor prognosis. So whether someone wishes to be at home at the end of their life or in an alternative care setting, just so that someone who's never met this person before is really aware of, of the detailed conversations and plans that have been put in place so far. So can we just clarify what exactly is different now compared to before? So how are urgent care plans managed even a year ago to now? And you can both present your points of view because, Phil, you are working on the GP side. Catherine, you're in the palliative care setting. So what kind of changes do you see that are present now? To which extent uh, has the repetition of information being eliminated or just the wonder from the healthcare providers, does this patient in front of me have an urgent care plan or not? So I think what the urgent care plan system has given us over the last few months is definite increased visibility, I think, because of the digital integration, particularly with the GP systems, but also with the London care records, so the HIEs around London for the acute hospitals as well. We now have access directly to the urgent care plan system, whereas before there was often barriers with passwords and various things. And so it wasn't always easily accessible to be able to view a care plan, whereas now absolutely a lot of those barriers are starting to be broken down. Um, wishes and care plans are much more visible to the providers across London. I don't know whether there's anything you want to add, Phil, around the GP think from, side. Yeah, from my perspective, we did have a previous end-of-life care plan, and that, that was focused largely on end-of-life. So I think what we've got now is a platform that allows us to focus more on a wider spectrum of urgent care plans and then in the future, build other care plans that allow us to become more specialised in different areas. For example, frailty, mental health, you know, diabetes are, are ones that have been considered. So I think that's, for me, the big step. And also we're doing less duplication of data. We've now got the technology that allows data to be stored 
in, say, the GP system and transferred over to the um, urgent care plan and vice versa. So those are the big differences over what we had a year ago. But if you compare what we had a few years ago before we had any care planning, then the systems were completely disconnected and it was very difficult to share any information. Catherine, anything that you want to add in terms of uh, the past and now? Well, just that, as Phil said, if you're thinking back many years, the UCP is unique in being a system that's accessible across London by all healthcare professionals from a variety of different services, whether they be community-focused, hospice, hospitals, urgent care, ambulance services, out of hours GPs. And what we know from London is that different hospitals and everyone's on different systems and there's no connection, no integration, as Phil said. You know, that that being able to see the urgent care plan and have everything in a space where all health care professionals can actually view it and be able to manage the patient in line with their wishes is just a huge step in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we've got lots more wishes and we want to make it bigger and better, which we're obviously absolutely planning on doing. We're definitely making significant steps towards what we hope to achieve for London. When we're talking about these kinds of huge projects that enable data fluidity, they take a lot of time, they're complex because so many stakeholders need to be included, need to be informed. The One London project started in 2018. In 2020, 100 representatives of the public were included to share their opinions and expectations about what the shared care record should look like and what they expect from healthcare digitalization. But what was your experience throughout this time and process? To which extent were healthcare providers included in the process because the pandemic happened in between and even without the pandemic, uh, NHS or most healthcare systems at the moment are strained. Many clinicians can only deal with what's directly in front of them. We know that there's ambulances waiting in front of hospitals because of all the challenges with waiting times and resources. How did you see this whole digital transformation uh, process that was happening in the last four years and is ongoing? As you say, it, it's always challenging in the NHS very often and the last few years have been no exception to that. But I think what it has done is also highlight some of the things that are really important to try and help us make life easier and to make sure that certain challenges don't happen again. And the actual connectivity and the sharing of healthcare information about patients is one of those things that has really come to the fore as an absolute priority, despite everything that we've been going through within the NHS. And I think that's both hospitals and GPs and community settings as well. And so I think although we are busy and we continue to be busy, it certainly makes you recognise that it's very, very important that those developments absolutely carry on underneath. And especially when it's highlighted as a priority to try and help prevent and manage things going forward, 